We're working our way through 1 John, and we're at the end of 1 John. Now we're at chapter 5, so let's go there, 1 John chapter 5. I guess you know that since you just read it. <clears throat> By way of introduction, look at the first verse there. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is a Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Here's what I want you to notice, verse 2 there. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. I mean, maybe we first read that, you say, that doesn't even make a lot of sense. So let's read it again. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. What does loving God and keeping His commandments have to do with loving those who are born of God? You know, and that's the question that we're going to address this morning. I, I was trying to figure out a good title for this, and I was like, how to know if it's true love. And I thought everybody's going to think, you know, I'm talking about relationships, <laughs> and I'm trying to encourage all the single guys here to go find a, how do you know if it's true love, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do we know whatever our relationship is, whoever we're loving, whether it's our parents, you know, our our, uh, our, our children, if you are parents, our, uh, man, I, just whatever the relationship, uh, our spouses, how do we know it's true love? How can we recognize that? How can we spot it? And so right away, what I want you to notice, and we've talked about this a lot in 1 John, they can be kind of confusing verses in 1 John, and, and people start getting tripped up a little bit about whether you could lose your salvation or or maybe you're not really saved if you don't demonstrate some of these things that are in 1 John. And when it talks about in this chapter things like, well, if you're born of God, you'll love the brother. You know, if you don't love the brother, you're not born of God. Somebody will say, well, you know, how, you know, how do I know if that love is real? And that's what this chapter is about. Notice, first of all, it doesn't say you're just to unconditionally love everybody, right? You're just supposed to unconditionally love everybody, and no matter what, no matter who they are. And I know I'm in good company here, and this isn't going to be a surprise to anybody. Hold your place in 1 John and go to Psalm, Psalms, the book of Psalms, and look at Psalm 139. Recently preached on this in Iola, and, and uh, you know, we're... We've got a song in our songbook, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. And uh, right before that verse, though, so David's telling God to search his heart. And right before that, here's what he says in verse 21, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Now, when you say that to the world or even to the majority of Christians out there and you say that there's a time to love and a time to hate, they say, oh, no, you're never supposed to hate anybody. I mean, I'm serious. That's, that's, that's what you get out there. You're just supposed to love everybody. And so this doesn't even make sense in the context of uh, the Bible and comparing Scripture with Scripture that we would just love everybody unconditionally. Now, we'll talk in a minute about what love is. Uh, but I'm saying that, that this shouldn't be a surprise, but to many Christians it is because this is confusing. What we call love in our society today is not true love. Right. Okay, And we'll talk about that in a minute, but look at Revelation. Revelation. And uh, there's a couple places where it talks about this, but in chapter 2 we see uh, he's writing to the seven churches of Asia. And let's just go to chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Okay, so there was something in their heart, something that they loved. It was their first love. And it says that you left that, right? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Now look at verse 6. Right? Same Lord talking to the same church. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
So now, is, is is there any is there any universe in which hate and love are the same thing? <laughs> it's not. You either love something or you hate it, right? And so he's actually telling him, hey, God's saying, no, 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 you left your first love. Now, I know you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and that's good because I hate those too, but you've lost your first love. So you see kind of like uh, uh, two, it almost seems contradictory to somebody who just believes love is just this gushy feeling that you're supposed to do for everybody and never harm a fly and all this kind of stuff. Well, I'm going to tell you, I struggled with this for a lot growing up, you know, because you meet a lot of different people that teach different things and you know, uh, let's say you get someone knocks on your door and they're telling you about this other book out there that's not the Bible, <laughs> you know, it's a, but it helps to explain the Bible. And they begin teaching you what they believe about salvation. And you think, hey, these guys are going door to door and they're preaching a false gospel and sending people to hell. And you get mad inside and you think, man, I don't want to bless this person. I don't want to say, God bless you. And you think, well, maybe that was wrong. Maybe I just need to love them anyway. Then you come across 2 John and it says not to even bid them Godspeed, right? Which is exactly what it's saying. That right, righteous indignation inside you to hate something that's going on or to hate what somebody is doing is because you love God. And so David said, I love God so much. If I love him, that means I have to hate what he hates. All right. Somebody once said you got to you can't love the flowers without hating the weeds. All right. I told a guy that one time I, after I got done preaching a similar context, he was a guy that had just been kind of come into our church for a little while. And afterwards he said, I just don't think uh, I agree with what you said. And I was like, well, what's that? That you that, that, that there's ever a time to hate somebody. I think we were going through Ecclesiastes and it was there was a time. Literally, there's a time to love and a time to hate. Amen. And he said, he said, I just don't think there's ever a time to hate. And I was like, well, isn't that what the Bible said? He said, yeah, but I just don't think that's right. And I said, well, well look. Let me explain it to you. If you love the flower, you're going to hate the weeds. And he was like, no, I think I just, I love the weeds too. And I was like, see, I don't think you're coming back <laughs> after this conversation because you're not getting it. You either believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible. Okay. So I hope that, that you understand this as I go through that. I think you, it's pretty self-explanatory, but look at verse two and three. This chapter begins to tell us a little bit about what love looks like. Verse two, by this, no, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Let's talk about that here for a second. How do we know we genuinely love someone? Now, according to this text, we can't, say that we're loving somebody properly and at the same time be disobeying God and not keeping God's commandments. Now that's going to come up a lot in a lot of situations. There's going to be a case where you say, well, I really love that person. And somebody might say, well, I love them so much that I can't do what God wants me to do. And that according to the Bible, then that means you don't love them. You're not really loving them because loving God I mean, loving God's people is going to include loving God and keeping His commandments according to this text. Let me give you an example. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis 3, verse 6, popular verse. The fall of mankind. Genesis 3. And verse 6. And I've heard people talk about this and say, well, Adam just loved Eve so much. He just loved her so much that he couldn't bring himself to let her be punished and, he, and, and, and not, you know, join in with her. It says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat it and gave also unto her husband with her. And he, did, uh, and he did eat. Now, later on, Paul's going to say it was the woman that was deceived and not the man, right? So what we're literally reading is that the woman was deceived by the serpent, ate of the fruit. Adam is like, oh, what did you do? You know we're not supposed to do that. And she's like, no, no, come on, eat it. For me, please, come on, eat it. And he's like, okay, because <laughs> I love you, right? I'll eat it because I love you. Did he really love her? 
proof about how much he loves her is whenever Jesus says, hey, what's going on? I mean, God says, uh, <laughs> what's going on? And he's like, the woman, she may be doing it. <laughs> right? right? It's not love. And so when we pretend like we love somebody, but we really don't love them, guess what that is? That's self-love. You know, all sin is, is basically self-love, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that we do, uh, contrary to God's commandments, is based on the fact that we love ourselves more than, more than we love uh, God. And so when we pretend to love somebody or try to convince ourselves that we love somebody, and uh, it's really self-love if it's not true love. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. I'll take you to several Proverbs on the type of love that we're supposed to have for our children. In Hebrews chapter 12, let's start in verse 4. Ye have not, I'm sorry, ye have not yet resisted unto, unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For verily, for a few days, uh, um, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, God chastens us. Anybody who's been saved any length of time and has tried to run from God and go after their own way knows the chastening hand of God. I've heard a lot of stories, testimonies in here about how God uh, chastens somebody who is a chi is his child and tries to go uh, their own direction, and he chastens them. And so we all, you know, most of us can relate to that. And so it's kind of like the father. I mean, this is a perfect example. God is the perfect father. So if we're being a father to our kids and we chasten them, guess what? They're not going to think that we love them. <laughs> You can try the whole, hey, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. They don't believe it. They think you hate me, right? You did something, you got in trouble, and then uh, you get the wrath of parents poured out on you, and you're like, man, my parents hate me. And, uh, you know, this, this is something that happens. And, and, you know, particularly when kids become teenagers, you know, you heard those story you've seen the examples yourself i'm sure about the girl you know falls after this rebellious guy and the mom and dad are like no you're not going to be with that guy and she's like oh you hate me you hate me you just don't want me to be happy well guess what you can let them say that all they want you can let them throw a fit you can let them get mad at you and throw things or whatever but you're actually demonstrating that you love them right because you don't want to, them to be with somebody who God would say that they shouldn't be with. Okay, so, so this is how we know uh, true love, okay? Uh, another example, a pastor, a pastor can't stand up, and a lot, of, a lot of them will, and say, well, I just love the flock. I just love this church. I love these people so much that I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to preach on something that's going to make them uncomfortable or whatever. I'm just going to give them what they want because I love them so much. Well, you know, any preacher that does that is going to be disobeying God. And you can't say that you love people while dis disobeying God, right? So number one, the prerequisite for properly loving others is that we love the Lord first. Everything you do in life has got to be started with your love for God. I love Him with all my heart, and therefore, you know, I'm gonna, I can begin properly loving others. <clears throat> the way we show the Lord love is by obeying Him and keeping His commandments. I've preached this before several times. Actually, it's a, it's a thought that 
comes back to my mind a lot about how there's different types of love, okay? Uh, I like to call it upward love, a downward love, and uh, outward love, okay? So when we show our love towards God, and I say God because he's the ultimate authority, but really anybody who's an authority, if children are showing their love for their parents, how are they going to show their love for their parents? Not by showing them mercy, right? <laughs> Their ch children are going to show that they love their parents by obeying them and doing what they ask them to do. Now, a downward love, you know, same would be true for a boss or something like that. You love them by obey it, obeying them. A downward love would be where somebody in authority says, hey, I'm going to have mercy on them. I'm going to treat them right. I know that they don't necessarily deserve this, but I'm going to uh, 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 help them out in this situation. They're showing mercy. A great example of this would be Exodus chapter 21. But, I mean, just think about it. If a child says, oh, I, I love you, Mom, I love you, Dad, and then they won't do anything that the mom and dad tells them to do, they can say they love them, but are they really loving them? No, they're not loving them because they're disobeying everything they say. The way that they show love, the very definition, the way that they show love is by obeying them and doing what they tell them to do. Exodus chapter 21 is a good example about servants and masters. So look at uh, verse 1 here. Let me read the first few verses. This is a great story. The law is just being given to Moses here, and it says, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she hath borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Now look at this next verse. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall always also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So, I mean, what kind of love would you have to have for your master to say, uh, just take me over to the door, get out the awl? I mean, I can't even think about how this would play out exactly. Hammer that thing in there, pierce my ear. So if any guys have ear piercings, uh, yes. Guys do have earrings in the Bible, but they're slaves. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, he, he pierced their ears, and what he's doing is signifying, I love my master. I don't want to go out for free. You know, Six years, that's not enough. I want to live with him forever. <laughs> my wife, my family, we're all going to serve him because we love him. Now, I look at that story and s suspect probably there was a good master who loved the servant, and probably there was a good servant who loved and obeyed his master, or else they probably wouldn't have this kind of uh, uh, relationship. Almost certainly, the servant was willing to show his love by obeying keeping his master's commandments. Otherwise, what would be the point of doing that? But if you're going to have true love, genuine love, the prerequisite is that you love God. The Bible says God is love. You know, we really don't even know. We might think that we do, but we really don't even know how to love somebody. If we don't keep the commandments, God's the one that's going to show us how to properly love somebody. All right. Number two is this. Look back at our, at our text here. First John chapter five. Point number two is this. The good news is, OK, so the prerequisite to loving somebody is that we first love the Lord. OK, here's the here's the uh, good news. He's pretty easy to love. <laughs> the Lord is easy to love. Look at first John two. Uh, well, look, look, look at verse 3 of our text. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Now, it's, it's a lot easier to love your parents when you realize that the commands that they're putting on you is for your own good, and that they actually love you, and they're taking care of you, and they provide for you, and they do everything, so why wouldn't they want what's best for you? Okay, and so it's pretty easy whenever we realize that all that God tells us to do, all His commandments are for our own good. 
There's no reason to say, like, oh, i got to keep the commandments. Oh, but they're so hard. You know, I don't want to do. No, they're for our own good. Look at 1 John chapter 4 now. Back up on a page. Chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Look at verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. When we realize how much the Father loved us and what he's saved us from and, uh, and what he's given us and allowed us to have, man, how could you just not naturally love him and want to obey and keep his commandments? Like the good master, right? He is the perfect uh, master and he loves us with that downward love I'm talking about. He's gracious to us. He's merciful. I mean, who could say in here, God hasn't been merciful to me in my life. <laughs> the very fact that you can be saved and on your way to heaven shows that he was merciful, okay? But not only that, here's what he says about his, Jesus says about his own love. He says, come unto me, Matthew chapter 11, 38 and 30, he says, 38 through 30, 28 through 30, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. People say serving, serving the Lord is just so hard. I mean, people must think that it's hard because that's why so few do it, <laughs> right? People think serving the Lord is so hard, but it's not hard. His yoke is easy. You get with the program and you start serving Him and doing what He wants you to do and things in your life start falling in place. You're like, man, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> serving the Lord is great. It's not hard to serve him. It's not hard to show him the proper kind of love. Look at verse 4, uh, back to our text. 1 John 5, look at verse 4 through 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, world even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? God, can you believe how easy it is to get saved? Now, I know people out there try to make it difficult, right? How easy it is to get saved, to just realize that He is uh, our Savior, that He has paid the price for our salvation, and just to accept that and receive that, and to believe in our heart that that's true, right? And so that's so simple, and as a result of that, guess what? You have the victory. You say, oh, no, life is tough. You don't understand how hard things are. You're not going to hell, all right? You put your faith in Jesus. You have overcome, all right? You are overcome through your faith is what the Bible says. Look at uh, verse 6 now. Not only are we just so thankful for the love that he showed on us and his yoke's easy and his burden is light and, and uh, his commandments aren't grievous, but when we think about just who he is and how powerful he is, how could anybody in this world ever deny the fact that there's a creator? Of course, the Bible says, you know, you would have to be willingly ignorant, right? You'd have to willingly want to deny that there's a creator because we look around and we see that we know it in our heart. I believe every man's given a measure of faith, but here's what we understand about God, especially as we read in the Bible and we hear about him. Uh, number one, look at verse six. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Of course, modern versions want to take all this stuff out of the Bible. They, they say, oh, that's not supposed to be in there. You know, really, the whole thing doesn't flow if you take that out of there. <laughs> it's so weird that they would say that that's not supposed to be in the original. Okay, for there are three that bear witness, uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Look, all these three, you know, you're supposed to have two or three, two, two or three witnesses, right, to be able to convict somebody or to be able to have your testimony be true in court or whatever. And he's saying, look, you got the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. These three are one, right, and this is the witness that testifies you. But then keep reading. He says... And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. 
And these three agree in one. Now, what is it, if you back up, what is it that we were supposed to believe? Verse, verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world, world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? All right, we use this word, I was taught in Bible college, I know how they try to use fancy words and terminology, and it's just kind of people puffing themselves up and everything, but, but I, I've always liked this one. It says that Jesus is the God-man, right? 100% God, 100% man, right? Born of a virgin, and so therefore, he doesn't have a human father. He's got God the Father, right? And he's inside his mother's womb. And so there's this weird, uh, not weird, but this amazing thing that happened where God could actually become a man, right? And so he's the God man. Now, what does that have to do with this verse? Well, this verse says that there's three uh, that bear witness in earth, all right? And it says what? The blood, uh, the, uh, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Okay, the spirit, the water, and the blood. What are we talking about? Well, let's go and see what the same author, John, has to say that I think will shed light on this. Look at John 19. John 19. Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Of course, this is Jesus and the thieves that are on the cross, and they're trying to do something. They're, they're, they're trying to make sure that they're dead before the Passover comes, right? Then came the soldiers, break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he, what he, uh, that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture would be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And so John is saying, look, I, 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 there's a witness. I saw this, okay? The, the spear was put into his side, and blood came out, and water came out, right? And he's saying that when he gave up the ghost, right? Here, here, here's, here's the way I look at that verse. He gave up the ghost, all right? That means, hey, there was a spirit in him, and now it's not there anymore. When uh, he was born, he was born in water. You say, I don't think that's what that means. Well, in John 3, 16, Jesus tells Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, how can I, can I go back into my mother's womb, be born a second time? And he says, uh, well, let's look at it, John 3. Verse 4, Nicodemus said, how, uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So I, I think that scripture just you know, perfectly uh, defines itself, that when... You're in, born in your mother's womb, right? That's being born of water or born of the flesh or born in the sack of water. And so uh, you born in the, in the water. Look, I think uh, Mary probably had a witness. Mary probably had evidence that Jesus was born in water, right? And he was born at human birth. On the cross, he gives up the ghost. There's the spirit that departs from him. Then they stab him in the side. And this water and blood comes out, right? There's a whole another message uh, on that, uh, some, symbol, some symbolism on that. But he says, look, these three, the, go the, the spirit, spirit and ghost are interchangeable in the Bible. The spirit, the water, and the blood bear record. What do they bear record of? That there was something special about this man. He wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a prophet. He was the son of God, Amen. right? You say, well, how do you know uh, that, that, that John's witness was true? 
Well, here's what the Bible says. We, don't, we have something better than, uh, than just the witness of a man. Uh, look, look at, back to our text, 1 John. And his witnesses, what is it? Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. So here's how salvation works. Here's what is so great and why God is so amazing and you can love him easily, right? Because number one, here's how you know you're saved. A lot of people, well, I'm just not sure I'm saved, right? Well, the, number one, you read the Bible, right? The Bible bears witness of the gospel message. You receive that gospel message because you read that and you believe that. And then the Bible says that his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the sons of God, right? So once you truly believe by faith, that Jesus is the Son of God in the gospel message that the Bible gives us, the Spirit resides inside you, and you know you're born again. Look, so somebody stands there and says, well, I'm just not sure I'm born again. That's highly suspect, right? Because that Spirit should be bearing witness in them. You know, and I've had other people say, well, I don't think I can lose my salvation. I just, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of questions. There's stuff that they're uncertain about. But they're like, but one thing I know for sure, you know, I'm saved. Now, that kind of person, you know, I might trust that they're saved. They're just still learning and still growing. But their spirit beareth witness. And, hey, I believe the gospel, and I know I'm saved, right? That's the confidence that we have. And so the number one thing, that uh, G why we know that his love is so easy, he's so easy to love, is just because, number one, he went through the entire record that we have in the Bible from the Old Testament to, uh, to, the, to the book of Revelation, and we see that whole record played out for you, the whole thing played out for me, this gospel, because he loved the whole world and gave his son. Now, if you don't think that uh, uh, salvation is acknowledging a fact and receiving that fact, because that's what most people say. I, I, hear, a lot, I hear that a lot. Well, you are easy believism. That's the, the accusation I get a lot. You are easy believism. You think that salvation just simply comes by believing a fact, right? That's what they say. We'll look at uh, verse 18. 1 John 5, verse 18. And I want you to count how many times it says no or that something is true or whatever. Okay, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. You see here, over and over he's saying, we know. We know that this is true. We understand. We believe that record. Back up a little bit. Here's a popular verse we use when we're out soul winning. Verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Look, He saved you by simply because you trusted in Him and you believed His witness and you took, him. Uh, you took it by faith. Okay, and then uh, here's the reality that I want you to notice in that, that part. If we back up to the beginning of the chapter where he says this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Okay, now we read that and we tend to think, that the implication is that everybody that's saved, we're just naturally going to love them. 
Okay? But here's the thing that I want you to consider. Now, we just we, we kind of read that in these last verses. When you or I are born of God, that does not mean that our in our flesh is reborn. Our flesh doesn't become new, right? So, oh, no, the Bible says all things become new. Yeah, guess what? You're still going to die. Guess what? When you got saved, you know, you still got acne. <laughs> you still got aches and pains. You still got all the, like, all things didn't become new. What became new was that inner person, all right? And that inner person is conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, we're trying to get this flesh to conform to the image of, of Jesus Christ, but it, it's never going to be completely there, okay? But we're trying to recognize that we live, uh, we live in the flesh, but we have, all right, the, the inner man who is perfect and, and, and uh, without sin, and so when we read this first John, a lot of people get confused and they're and they're confusing the spirit, the spiritual man and the in the flesh. Okay, but here's what he's saying. Uh, he that's begot, begotten of God, in the context of what we just read, right? He's talking about the water, the blood, the spirit, and all that kind of uh, stuff that we looked at. In the context here, what he's saying is Jesus is the begotten of the Father, right? From the foundations of the earth. He's the begotten of the Father. Knowing that one day, he said, uh, this day have I begotten thee, right? Which day was he talking about? Anybody know? This day? Somebody know where that scripture is? This day have I begotten you. He's talking about the day that he died on the cross. Somebody find that verse. <laughs> and so, uh, so it's actually Jesus that's the begotten, all right? We're born in the Spirit. Oh, I thought you were getting ready to tell me. Uh, we're born in the Spirit, but Jesus is uh, is the only begotten Son. Okay, uh, so anyway, now you'd be looking on looking for that for, for a minute. So I want to close on this last thing, uh, the very last verse. Let's go to it. All right, let's pause for a minute and look at that. Hebrews one five. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be, a, be to him a father, and he shall be to me a, a son. Uh, man, see, this is what happens when you shoot from the hip. <laughs> I'll get back, man. That's going to have to be another message now. But the day he was begotten is the day he died on the cross, but he did that from the foundations of the, uh, of the world. I'll come back to that. Let me. Uh, I shouldn't have stopped. Let's go to the last verse now of our passage. Last verse. Anybody ever read through 1 John and got to the verse and said, what in the world is that there for? It says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Okay, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Seems kind of like a strange way to conclude this passage that's about, you know, loving the begotten, you know, loving the Father, loving the Son. And uh, naturally, if we do that, uh, then we are going to love one another. Jesus said this in Matthew 22. I'm going to come back to the idolatry here in a minute. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is a prerequisite, see? Prerequisite to loving other people is to love the Lord. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But you don't know how to love your neighbor if you don't love God. You don't know how to love your neighbor if you're not born of the Spirit. So you have to first know how to love, uh, love the Lord. Now, when we love ourselves more than we love God, this is idolatry. This is what the Bible says, Colossians chapter 3, 5, real quick. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Okay, now, if you're going to love people, right, 
What do you have to do? You're going to have to obey the Lord. You're going to have to obey His commandments, right? Here's, here's what the Bible says. If you love the Lord, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay? According to the Bible, when you are coveting after other things, when you love yourself more than you love God, which is what happens anytime that you love some, you say that you love somebody, but really, uh, you know, you're just trying to trying to make, keep everybody happy. Uh, then what you're really doing is you're entering into idolatry. If you think about this, anybody who would refuse to obey, maybe they would come to the knowledge of truth and they would know who God is, know what the Bible says. And they would say, no, I choose to reject that and to go after another God, to go after another faith. What would be the motivation for doing that? There's got to be a self-motivation that says, you know, if I stick with that, I'm going to lose friends. If I stick with that, I'm going to have to give some things up that I don't want to give, give up. And their motivation for leaving the truth and going another direction is idolatry, is self-love. Right? It's covetous. It's wanting something of the flesh uh, more than you want God. And so when you would say, well, I know the Bible says that I have to do this, right? But I just love this person so much. I can't, you know, I don't want to do that. Our friendship will be severed. They won't like me anymore. They won't understand or whatever. What you're doing is you're putting yourself before God. And that's idolatry. That's not true love. That's not love for God, and that's not love for man. You might convince yourself and say, oh, no, no, I love God. I love, I love everybody. I love my neighbor. I love, you know, that's the number one thing when you ask somebody if they know for sure they're going to heaven, and they say, yeah, I've been pretty good, almost the next thing out of their mouth. I, I love everybody. <laughs> oh, really? You love everybody. And if you get them to explain what that means, it has nothing to do with following God and keeping His commandments, right? And that's the only way we can truly love somebody is love and commandments. So therefore, when you say, when the, when the world sees that you spank your children, for instance, they'll say, man, how hateful. Can you believe he spanks his children, right? But no, they don't understand that you have to, un, uh, you have to love God and go by God's rules and understand God's ways. And even if you don't want to obey that because uh, you don't understand it yet, you go by that, and then you realize, wow, this is actually true love. What did the Bible say? If I don't correct my children, then I actually hate them, right? In my actions, what I'm actually showing is not love. You say, oh, no, I just want my kids to know that I love them, and I want to be the cool dad, and I want to have a good relationship with them and all that. No, no, you're t teaching your children that you hate them, right? You are actually making yourself and your desire to be their buddies and all that kind of stuff, you are making that more important than God, which is idolatry. All right, so the only way uh, that we can truly love somebody is to very first love God and say, what does God say? And if we do that as a prerequisite, then He will begin to teach us what genuine love is because He's love. And He knows how to love perfectly. And as the closer we get in our walk with Him, the more we can love other people. But it's a true love. That's true love. That's, that's not a fake love. There's a lot of fake love going on out there. I mentioned preachers earlier. There's a lot of people that think uh, they're disguising this in love and they're saying that they love people, but really what it is is they don't want to preach against sin. They don't want to, you know, rebuke anybody. Uh, and so what that really is showing is that they actually love themselves more than God. Let's be careful not to do that, and I think that we're on a right, the right path here. We go soul winning, for instance, why? Because we love the Lord. Once we love the Lord, we begin to love people. Now, we don't, we're not perfect in the flesh. We don't love everybody <laughs> you know, just naturally like we should. But as we walk with the Lord and obey Him, we end up loving people. right? And that's what we can see uh, all the way through. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you'll help us to truly be Christians who love people, Christians who love our spouses, Christians who love our children, Christians who love uh, those who work for us and uh, those who work with us. Lord, just help us to love people the way that we ought. 
and at the same time, hating those things that will hurt those that we love. Hating those things that would stop people from getting saved. Hating those things uh, that would cause, uh, cause heart, heartache and, uh, and, and try to thwart your plan. Help us to understand that loving you means obeying uh, your commands and, uh, and, lo- and, and we can't love people until we learn how to love you. I thank you for this church, Lord. I thank you for this uh, one-year anniversary. And I give you all the glory. Certainly, there's, I know 100% there's nothing I did. Uh, you put this all together. I pray that you'll help me be wise and be a good leader. And I pray that you'll bless uh, those who put in the work and the effort to see souls saved. I pray that you'll help us all grow in wisdom and in knowledge. Uh, of your word and in the understanding of what your will is for us. And now I pray, Lord, there'll be uh, many years ahead for this work and that you'd be glorified by all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen.